Guys, 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 I got to talk to Jim Rogers. He's a legend in the investing space, made millions and millions and millions of dollars, and he was kind enough to take some time out of his busy day to chat with me and share some valuable lessons on how you can prepare for the tumultuous times ahead. Make sure you watch till the end for some of the juiciest tips. Let's go! So I, I don't want to waste your time. I know you're busy. So I hope you don't mind if we jump straight into it. I've got a no, lot of no, questions. I want to, I want to, I want to, yes. Okay, great. Um, so as you already know, like the, the monetary and fiscal policy in the state is quite worrying. Um, particularly my concern is how it will impact people like you and me who live outside the US and, and in this case, Singapore. So uh, my first question is, what do you think are the chances that the U.S. goes into hyperinflation? Well, throughout history, uh, when people have printed a lot of money, it has usually led to at least to inflation. Uh, the U.S. is a gigantic debt, the largest debtor nation in the history of the world. So the combination of staggering debt and lots of money printing historically was certainly has led to inflation. Hyperinflation is rarer. I mean, there's plenty of cases of hyperinflation in the world. Uh, not so many with the world's reserve currency or the world's medium of exchange. And in fact, I don't think I can think of a single one where the reserve currency has led to uh, hyperinflation, but certainly hyperinflation or inflation, serious inflation, is a real possibility given the lessons of history. Okay, so uh, if if there is, well, let's take the worst case scenario, and if there is hyperinflation, or even if there is serious inflation, how does that impact the the Singapore market and the local currency here? Well, it depends on what Singapore does. If Singapore prints a lot of money. It's certainly Singapore is more likely to have serious inflation because it's a small country with a small, small currency. Um, and those are the kinds of currencies which have been more susceptible in the past. But, but can it, it depends on how much money they print. If they just talk about printing money, that's one thing. But if they run the printing presses as fast as they can, it will lead to more serious inflation. And inflation has never been good for anybody. Politicians love it because it's an easy answer, and at least for a while, they can tell people things are better. But it used, it has often gotten out of control and been bad for whichever nation, society, or economy we're discussing. So, in this situation, like, do you think there is any threat to the dollar as the reserve currency in, in, in a serious inflation situation? Oh no! Um, the, all the world's uh, Mediums of exchange have only lasted 100, 150 years at most uh, throughout history um, because most countries do, when they get on top, they start doing foolish things. They spend a lot of money, they borrow a lot of money, they get overextended militarily or whatever. Uh, and the US is doing all of the above. And there are now countries trying to look for an alternative to the US dollar as the world's reserve currency. Uh, for, 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 well, first for economic reasons, I told you the U.S. is the largest debtor nation in world history, and it's getting worse every day. And the world's medium of exchange is supposed to be neutral. You know, it's supposed to be something that anybody can use anywhere. That's what makes it the world's international medium of exchange. The U.S., unfortunately, when they get angry at you now, they, they put sanctions on you, and that's not Many people say that's not fair. That's not the way this is supposed to work. So various countries are looking to, to find something to compete with the U.S. dollar. China, Russia, India, Brazil, a few countries, Iran. They're all trying to find something to compete with the U.S. dollar. So I would suspect the U.S. dollar's days are numbered. So if, if that's and the, if case, the U.S. dollar's think? days are numbered, it depends again. It will depend on how other people react to that, that will determine their fate. You can't just make broad generalization because what Brazil does may be entirely different from what Korea does. Mm. What do you think would be the most likely, um, the strongest competitor to the, the US dollar as a reserve currency? The strongest competitor? Yeah. Well, 
at the moment, the only thing I can see that would be a com potential competitor is the Chinese renminbi, but you know, that's a pretty absurd right now because the renminbi is a blocked currency. Mm -hmm. I mean, you can't have a blocked currency as the world's medium of exchange. Now, the Chinese have been opening it up more and more since uh, 2005, but it's still a blocked currency. But I don't see anything else at the moment on the horizon which will be a competitor. Okay. So if we do experience some serious inflation, what can the, the average person do to protect or, or prepare themselves? What, how do you think they should um, construct their, their portfolio? Well, the average person should not listen to me or, or you or anybody else. The average person should stay with what she knows. Because that's how you protect yourself. You don't, you don't put your money into something where you saw on the internet. Because if something goes wrong, you don't know what to do. Um, I have silver, you know, I have gold, which I hope will be help protect me against potential uh, inflation, potential currency debasement, and historically they have worked. But we have to see, we have to see as we go forward. I mean, if you know about farmland, probably be, buying farms would be the best, uh, an even better uh, hedge against inflation or currency debasement. You know, something which will maintain its value or be in demand, those are the places that you protect yourself. But again, you know, Kenneth, if you know a lot about making shoes, that's going to help you in an inflationary period because you'll be able to survive and continue to make money. Right. So if you say that um, hopefully gold and silver is a is a inflation hatch, but if, if it's an inflation hedge and recently there's um, elevated expectations of inflation, so why, why is gold prices and silver prices taking a hit right now? Taking a hit? I mean, silver's doubled in the last year. Silver went up a lot. And whenever something, not whenever, but often when something goes up a lot, it, there's a correction. It, it, things things don't, don't go like that and go up. They go up like this. Mm -hmm. I mean... And that's, if you ask me, that's what's happening with silver and gold. I'm waiting to buy more of both. I'll probably buy more silver than gold. Nothing goes straight up. And things that do go straight up wind up going straight down. I've been around long enough to know that the last thing you want is to own something. Well, you, it, you, you, it's great to own something that goes straight up, but you better be getting ready to sell it because things that go straight up usually go straight down. So when, so when I was researching, normal, I, maybe I'm wrong, but this is a normal correction in a rising market, at least in my experience. Okay. When I was researching gold and silver, the, there was a lot of um, theories online that says that, you know, gold, the gold and silver markets are manipulated and rigged by the bullion banks. What, what are your thoughts on that? Oh, well, I've heard that for decades. Uh, yes, there are many people out there, there's, especially silver, it was usually silver. The theory was stronger about silver, but but it's about both. Yeah, no, okay, yes, it's it's. There are lots of conspiracy theories. There always have been about most everything, um, mm -hmm. and there probably always will be. Um, I don't put too much stock in it, but if one of the main reasons I don't put too much stock in it because they've been saying this about gold or at about silver for decades, and if it were the case. Okay, uh, it would it have, have to involve hundreds of people because you can't just sit in a room somewhere and say, okay, I'm going to manipulate silver or I'm going to suppress gold. It would take thousands of people all over the world to be in on the scheme because silver is a gigantic market. Gold is a gigantic, they're both gigantic markets and they're both international. So over the past 30 or 40 years, you would have had to have had thousands and thousands of people in on this and somebody would have, somebody would have talked. Somebody would have, you know, revealed the truth to the BBC or somebody. Maybe there is and has been this gigantic conspiracy to suppress gold and silver for decades, but I'm, I'm skeptical. Okay. So what, what about the gold and silver miners? If, if there is hyperinflation or, or serious inflation, is it still worth buying because the USD might be worth a lot less, like the, the currency debasement is so severe, then is that still worth buying the miners because they're usually denominated in USD as well? 
the mines, those silver mines, the gold mines. Is yep. that what you said? Yeah. Well, if you know the right silver mine, of course. I mean, you know, Kenneth, if you know a silver mine that's going to, or if you know somebody's going to discover silver or gold in Berlin, you should buy all the shares you can. Then let me know. But there are thousands of gold mines, thousands of silver mines in the world. Um, there was a very famous American writer once, uh, 100, 150 years ago, who said, a gold mine, the definition of a gold mine is a hole in the ground with a liar at the top of it, because he lost a lot of money investing in a gold mine. Um, so if you know the right ones, please buy all you can. Because you make a lot more buying the silver mine itself than buying silver. But as I said, there are hundreds of them, so be sure you're right. Okay. The the interest rates on the 10-year yield has been increasing recently. Do you think uh do you expect the Fed to implement any form of yield curve, yield curve control in the near future? Uh yeah, they've been trying, they always that's what the Fed, that's what they do. They, they think their job is to control interest rates. And the money supply. So yes, they've always, every day, they try to control interest rates, try to control yield. Um, and at times, they have a very strong influence. They are one of the biggest factors in the interest rate market. Inter bonds, interest rates are definitely in a bubble. We have never had bonds this expensive in world history, Kenneth, never. So it's clear that bonds are in a bubble, yield, low yields, or mm -hmm. certainly a result of a bubble, uh, but all bubbles pop, and this one will too. Um, interest rates, central banks, especially the Fed, since it's the most important central bank, will continue to try to control and control interest rates, but eventually it's going to get out of their control because their only goal these days and in recent history has been to keep interest rates as low as possible. Eventually, the market says, wait a minute, wait a minute, we know what's going on. We're not going to play this anymore. And the market has more money than any central bank. And when the market takes control and overwhelms the central bank, then you've got a very serious problem. Or the central bank has a very serious problem. America's had three central banks. The first two disappeared for a variety of reasons. This one probably will too eventually because they're so hopeless. Okay, and and what happens if interest rate go too high? Because the the U.S. debt is basically sky high. It, they can't actually afford for it to get too high, right? Well, that's true of many countries these days. U.K., many places, Japan. Okay. <laughs> uh, so yeah, that what you just said is an accurate statement. If and when interest rates get out of control or go higher and higher and higher. Many people are going to go bankrupt, state, city. I mean, even German cities. There are German cities that have debt problems now. Germany, Germany was always a paragon of virtue. But even those guys are making mistakes now. So what, what happens if there's this scenario where the, where the U.S. is insolvent? Well, in the 1920s, the U.K. was the richest, most powerful country in the world. There was no number two. They were so dominant. Uh, but 50 years later, the UK was bankrupt. Bankrupt. IMF had to fly into London Airport and bail them out. It was a miserable 50 years. Well, the last 20 or 30 years was a miserable time for the British. It's amazing to go from being the king of the world to bankrupt. But that's what can happen and has often happened in history and will happen to the US if history is any guide. How, how would that impact like the, the global economy if, if U.S. Were to, were to go bankrupt? <clears throat> a lot of people will suffer, um, especially people who are relying on the U.S. or who own U.S. dollars or whose businesses in the U.S., they, they will suffer too, just as many people in the U.K. suffered. If you were a U.K. citizen in the 60s, for instance, they, well before they were bankrupt, couldn't leave the country with more than 20 pounds in your pocket. That made lots of things difficult. Travel, the travel industry was not a great boom in the UK in times like that. So there will be serious consequences for the US. Uh, 
and figure it out. Anybody who's got a lot of uh, business with a country going bankrupt or a company going bankrupt usually suffers, including the citizens of that country. They'll put on exchange controls, as I told you. The British had serious exchange controls. You couldn't take money in and out of the country. It's a mess. I watched some of your other interviews and you said that you were interested in Japan. You were buying things in Japan and Russia. Can you tell me like what you're interested in and why? Well, in Japan, uh, I mean, Japan's got very, very serious problems. In fact, I've had, to my shock, three number one bestsellers in Japan in the last couple of years. Yeah. Uh, basically, the, the, basically the, the title of one of them is A Warning to Japan. Basically, it says, guys, Population has been declining for 11 years, 11 years declining, and debt has been skyrocketing every year for a long time. That's not a good scenario. They don't have babies and they don't have immigrants. So Japan's got serious problems. 10-year-old kid in Japan should, should leave or else learn self-defense because they're gonna be serious problems in 20 or 30 or 40 years. But in the meantime, I own Japanese ETFs because the Bank of Japan, the guy goes to work every day, prints money as fast as he can, and his word is unlimited, unlimited amounts of money. And he's buying ETFs and stocks and bonds. Well, he's got more money than I do, Kenneth. If he's buying Japanese ETFs, I'm buying them too. So I may not be in Japan in 30 or 40 years, but I'm not, yeah. not worried about that, obviously, but... I'm more interested in the next 30 or 40 weeks. So we're in this scenario where, where the, the Bank of Japan already owns like more than 50% of their assets and they're, they're going to keep buying, right? That's why you, you want to buy. But if they keep doing this, wouldn't it just devalue the yen even more? Eventually it ruins Japan, yes. It's, it's, it's a very simple lesson from history. You, you, you can't just keep doing this forever. You can do it for a while. Many countries have. But... There comes a time when the market says we're not going to play anymore. Yeah, so I'm, I'm sure all the central bankers are aware of this. It's, it's something that's been written throughout history. So, so why do they still continue to do it if they know that's the, the end game scenario? They think they're smarter than history and they think they should control it. Like the previous head of the central bank in the U.S., her name was Yellen, Dr. Yellen. Dr. Yellen had degrees from two fancy American Ivy League universities. She says, oh, don't worry. We have it under control now. We, we will eliminate financial or economic problems in the future. I, I, I think she really believes it. I don't think that's just because she's not just a complete liar. For whatever reason, she thinks they can control it. Well, the lesson, one of the, one of the, the main lesson of history is that people don't learn the lessons of history history would indicate that she's wrong we'll see okay so let's let's jump to the other side of the argument here okay because um i, I watched other people like harry dent um they're calling for a crash in van in april or may how, how likely do you think that would be they believe more in a deflationary I, 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 i'm a very bad market timer i have no idea it could happen but we're certainly going to have a bear market again someday um, and there's certainly staggering amounts of money printing, and there are bu speculative bubbles developing. I told you the bond market is a bubble. Yeah. Uh, we're starting to see bubbles develop in some shares. I mean, Tencent never goes down. Samsung never goes down. Alibaba, uh, 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 Google never goes down. You know, so bubbles are developing, but not all stocks are up or, or in a bubble yet. So it could go on for a while. I have, I'm a very bad market timer. I have absolutely no idea when it's going to come to an end. Okay. So uh, uh, like you said just now, um, Japan is experiencing aging population and declining growth for 11 years now. And when Harry was explaining his reasoning for the, the deflationary event, it's also due to demographic cycles in the U.S. So it clearly both of you um, viewed demographic cycles as a very important thing. So how, how do you look at that to inform your investments? Well, I, I, I just got to tell you, I'm, I'm buying Japan. I own Japan, uh, even though I foresee serious problems, demographic problems down the, down the road. 
one needs to know everything as much as one can about any economy or any country where you invest, but demographics rarely have been the only deciding factor, at least not uh, as it's happening. Eventually, yes, it will mean Japan is a disaster. I mean, where are we gonna get our sushi in 50 years? Who's gonna be there? Who's gonna pay the debt? I mean, in 50 years, there will be no, it's arithmetic. It's not some wild forecast. You add the debt, which goes up every day. You subtract the people, which go down every day. At least to serious, serious problems. Um, but there are other things going. I said, I, I, I'm investing in a country like that, Japan. I'm buying there. So it's a lot more to, you have to, a lot more is involved than just the demographics of any country. But America doesn't have a demographic problem. America's population is still rising. Okay. It's aging, it's aging, and the debt is staggering. But the Japanese demographic problem is much worse. Europe has demo Europe has serious aging problems, but the Europeans have immigration. They're legal, but they have it. It doesn't matter what's legal. I mean, it matters if it's legal or illegal, but the net result is if you've got immigration, legal or illegal, you don't have a declining population. Uh, one of the, the arguments that I, I, I saw online as well is also that we, the central bankers say that we haven't really seen much inflation over the last two decades. In fact, we've seen more disinflation than actual inflation. And then Powell even came out to say recently that there's no relationship between M2 and economic growth. I mean, he said we have to unlearn the relationship between money supply and the economy. What, what do you think about that? Yes, we have had huge increases in M2, but one of the reasons that inflate, two reasons inflation is not so, the oil price of oil collapsed and oil is the single most important factor in determining whether we have inflation or not. And oil went down 80% at the, at, from the top to bottom. So that certainly helps a lot of inflation numbers. And second, governments lie. I mean, and governments have a reason, especially in the US, you know, since so all wage contract, many wage contracts and pension plans, et cetera, are tied to the uh, inflation numbers, they, the governments lie about it. They have a, an incentive to lie about it, and they do. I mean, I don't know if you shop. Uh, you, you probably have your butler do your shopping. But those of us who go shopping, we know that prices are up. But why, why do you think they would say things like, you know, uh, there's no relationship between the M2 and, and economic growth? Then if, if that's the case, then why, why don't we just print 100 trillion, right? Why are we still wasting time with one, two trillion? Like, they know the, the impact of that. So why would they still say that? It's, it's not as if the, the regular person doesn't understand it, right? They seem to be in the process of doing that. I told you what the Bank of Japan's doing. Uh, America's printing huge amounts of money. The balance sheet of the central bank in America a year ago was what, seven, six or seven yeah. less. A year ago was maybe five or six trillion dollars. Now it's doubled. I mean, they're doing it. They can't say to you, Kenneth, you know, this is going to lead to disaster. They can't even say, Kenneth, this has always led to disaster. A couple of times, you, the, one of them will slip and say something like, we don't really know how this is going to work. It's an experiment, but they, they know PR. If they go out and say to everybody, this is going to be a disaster, or history would indicate it might not work, you know, they lose their jobs. Yeah. Their main interest is keeping their jobs. They don't care about you and me or, or kids. They care about their jobs. We're running out of time here, so I'm going to end this quickly. Um, the one, one question that I had is when I was studying um, the, the, the markets and I looked at the S&P the, the 500 and versus gold since 1971 when President Nixon took US off the gold standard. Gold has risen 48 times while the S&P 500 has risen 23 times even if you reinvest the dividends. So, you know, Warren Buffett always talks about how gold is not a producing asset. So, if, if you compare it like this, then does it mean that the, the S&P 500 hasn't really produced much in those 20 years? Oh, sorry, in those 50 years? Well, if you use those comparisons, yes, but 
you have to remember that gold was a, an artificial market for the 40 years before that. Uh, and so, I mean, if you take a 1931 uh, or 32 or 35, as yeah. a comparison, I think you would find a huge, huge, huge difference. The shares yeah. have gone up a lot more than gold. Uh, but the, the, the reasons that gold went up a lot in those 50 years is because in 1932 and three, the English and the Americans and other governments artificially set the price of gold uh, at a 35 US dollars an ounce was the number they picked for whatever reason. Well, so for 40 years, People didn't have incentive to mine gold or explore for gold because there was there was no profit in it, very or very little profit in it. So for 40 years, you had the supply stagnant or declining, and anything where you'd have the su supply stagnant for 40 years, uh, probably once you release the, the 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 price control, which they did in 19, eventually the early 70s. The price is bound to go up, no matter what it is, whether it's feathers or sugar or, or whatever it happens to be. So I would suggest, and yes, your your numbers are great and accurate, but the artificial reasons that go was where it was in 1971, and shares mm -hmm. have had done better. Shares had done much better in the 40 years before that, and gold had done nothing yeah. in the 40 years before that. And that led to supply and demand distortions for gold. Okay. And last question. Gold. Last question before I let you go. Um, what are you currently reading, and what what can I or other people read to be better prepared and learn more about the markets and what's coming in the future? If you want to know what's going on, first of all, you should pursue your own interests and passions. That's going to teach you, even if your own interest is shoes or whatever, some anything you pick out. If you understand and focus on what you love and know a lot about, and you are attentive and you can think from left to right, it was the urge, you will start figuring things out. So that's the most important. But if you want to understand what's happening, I don't know, read the Financial Times from London, read uh, the Wall Street Journal, read the Economist, the many things you can read. Um, to keep you informed of what's happening. But again, you have to read them with a nuanced eye because, you know, it doesn't matter. The Wall Street Journal, whether we like it or not, and it's certainly more independent than most, is an arm of the, it's, it's in the US, let's believe it at that. Likewise, the Financial Times. So you have to learn to read these things so that you can understand, ah, yes, they have their own innate, unconscious bias in many ways. You have to figure it all out. Read, I, I try to teach my children, if they're going to watch TV, watch TV from five or six countries or read newspapers from five or six countries because every one of them thinks and even knows they're right. But they can't all be right. Yeah. So if you read from five or six different countries, then it'll all go into your brain and you'll stir it around, we hope, and something will come out. Your own synthesis, and we hope yours is right. So the answer is there's no answer to your question. You have to read or look at or look at a lot of internet sources. Whatever your source of information is, try to look at different countries, different views, because all of them think they're right. Well, my best advice to everybody is A, follow your own passions, but B, please become knowledgeable because we are in entering even more complicated and difficult times. Once you get knowledge, you will understand what's going on. You'll start getting worried. And once I'm you're super worried, worried right now. <laughs> but once you get worried, you'll start getting prepared. Yeah. Um, but you have to figure out your own way to be prepared. As I say, if I said to you, oh, you know, Kenneth, go become a fisherman. That's a what great way to survive all of this. And you hate being in a boat <laughs> or you hate the water or you hate blah, blah. It's not gonna be do any good for you to become a fisherman unless you happen to love it yourself. So yeah. you have to figure out your own way. Okay, that makes a lot of sense. Thank you so much, Jim. And Thank you. Good luck. Thank you.
Yeah. I'm sure I'll see you somewhere in Singapore. <laughs> Thank you. Bye-bye. Right. Bye. All right, that was my chat with Jim Rogers. If you found it valuable and you enjoyed the video, please make sure to give a thumbs up and remember to click the subscribe button below so you get more videos like this. I'll see you in the next video.